night. It was brought to my attention uh, a couple of days ago um, by one of the subscribers to this YouTube channel that Ecclesiastes does not support the resurrection. It denies it. Well, if we do it, read it properly, let's take a look. Ecclesiastes, without God, everything is meaningless. Now, Dr. Robert Morley is a good Christian author states in his book, Death in the Afterlife, he clarifies a lot of points of contention about the value of the Bible and what its message is. Perhaps the best way to understand Ecclesiastes, he says, let me get myself out of the way here, is to compare it to the book of Proverbs. Both books are found within the poetical section of the Old Testament. The five poetical books of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs deal with the practical issues of life instead of such things as prophecy, history, or theology. They are called wisdom literature because they seek to educate us about life and how to live it. So we're not necessarily going to get a spiritual point of view, but a physiological one, a physical one, about living our life on the planet. Although Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are both wisdom literature, they teach us about life in two totally different ways. Proverbs begins with the assumption that there is a personal God. There is a personal God who gives meaning to all of life. Proverbs 1.7 in, in contrast, Ecclesiastes begins with the assumption of the man under the sun, i.e. the autonomous man without God. Keep in mind, that's the context. Three things I learned in seminary to keep in mind. Number one, the context. Number two, the context. And most importantly, number three, the context. So Ecclesiastes 1, 16 to 17. You can look at that and see whether or not this is true. This is the man under the sun, not bringing God into the picture. He's not a believer in God. Proverbs begins with God and asks the question, how should we live? Ecclesiastes begins without God and asks, why should we live? Proverbs is positive, while Ecclesiastes is negative and pessimistic. Proverbs promises us that life will be wonderful if we begin with God, 1, 1 to 7. Ecclesiastes warns us that life is empty and without meaning if we begin without God. 1, 2. In Proverbs, wisdom is more important than money. We'll look back here. I had to do this with one hand. In Ecclesiastes, money is more important than wisdom. 10, 19, 1, 17, and 18. In many other ways, Ecclesiastes reveals the warning that without God, Nothing in life will have any meaning or significance. You get that at the end of Ecclesiastes. He presents his case, Solomon. What is man without God? Why should we be living on this planet and how? And then he gets to the end. The end is, is that without God, everything is meaningless. If you miss that, you miss the whole point of it. Context, context, context. After giving the perspective of autonomous man for 11 chapters, the author concludes by bringing the Creator into the picture, 12.1, defining death as the ascent of the Spirit to God. Here we go. Is there an afterlife? Yes. And the necessity of beginning with God and the keeping of His commandments, 12, 13, and 14. It's always important to read from the beginning to the end. We have The Schofield Bible has a nice outline here. You can check how it goes. Futility of life. Human wisdom's better findings. We get close to it. Importance of obeying rules. But these are temporal rules. Despite wisdom, death is certain. Beware a little folly. The conclusion of the matter. The best thing possible to the natural man. Well, then we go, fear God and keep his commandments. So, 
Ecclesiastes 9, 3 to 12. Note that the theme of this part is, despite wisdom, death is certain. The viewpoint is entirely of what happens in an individual's physical lifetime. There is no consideration paid and made to what might or might not happen after one's physical death. If you don't address the issue, you can't presume one way or the other if it doesn't address it. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. From a perspective of without God, the author concludes this. The same destiny overtakes all. In other words, everybody dies, physical death. Notice that there is no perspective offered of a life after death. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Among Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. Again, there is no perspective offered of a life after death. The theme of everything is meaningless without it still being offered. But is this true? The author will conclude at the end that this is indeed not so when one obeys God. And the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgiven, forgotten. Well, once in Sheol, all experiences related exclusively to physical life are no longer possible. That's all it's saying. Those in Sheol, if they're there or not, if that exists or not, do not marry, procreate children, because they do not have bodies. The physical bodies are dead, innate, inert. Neither do they plan and execute business transactions. Once in Sheol, they cannot attend public worship in the temple and give sacrifices or praise. There are no bodily pressures such as eating or drinking. Those in Sheol do not have any wisdom or knowledge about what is happening in the land of the living. They are cut off from the living. They have entered a new dimension of reality with its own kind of existence. Psalm 6.5, Ecclesiastes 9.10, and so on. So the dead know nothing relative to the perspective of living under the sun, for they are obviously not present under the sun now when they are dead. So they, in effect, know nothing relative to the context of living under the sun. Furthermore, is it actually true that the dead know nothing, that they have no further reward, and that the memory of them is forgotten. Scripture says no, especially relative to God's memory of them and to rewards in heaven for faithful service, which is taught throughout Scripture as well as a conscious afterlife with every individual having a memory and knowledge and activities. But this isn't the issue of the context at the point. The point of being out of touch with God's viewpoint is clearly being made here. Everything is not meaningless, yet without God it is. That's the point. So the author is illustrating a point in his life when he was not in touch with God's viewpoint until the very end of the book. Context, context, context. There, the dead's love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with joyful heat. And for it is now that God favors what you do. Is this always true? Eat, drink, and be merry? Other passages say no. So obviously the author is making a point of such an attitude. Without God, indeed, everything is futile. So get all the gusto you can now, for then it will all end when you die. It is all meaningless. And the temporal life is, without God, all meaningless. But does it have to be? See chapters 11 and 12, the conclusion of the matter. If you read the whole book up to the very end and don't read the conclusion, you don't get the answer. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy your life. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome, toilsome labor under the sun. But the question is, is it really meaningless? Is this how God has set up the lives of individuals to be lived? Does God do meaningless things such that man's life has no value? And all is futile? The author is obviously making a point here. And his viewpoint and his viewpoint here does not reflect the truth that he will later expound upon in the last section of his book. Whatever your hand finds to do, <clears throat> do it with all your might, for in Sheol, an after death existence and not the grave, it is often mistranslated grave, but that is the Hebrew word kebab, 
where you, where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom relative to subject at hand in the context, life under the sun. Keep in viewpoint the context, i.e., while you are physically alive. I have seen something else under the sun. Notice that the perspective is exclusively and morbidly on whatever happens under the sun. It is all meaningless. Again, is it really? Well, if you treat the fact that this mortal life has nothing to offer except what you experience from the moment, and then, then it all ends and it's all meaningless. Well, that's the conclusion you'll make if you take God out of the equation. Consider the warped perspective the author has as he continues. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Overwhelming thing is, you've got so many years to live, and if that's all you view in the moment, then that's all you'll end up. It's all meaningless. Whatever happened to the sovereignty of God? Chance and meaninglessness is the author's God at this time as he continues on his morbid, morbid perspective. Verse 12, Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly like upon them, just like this COVID-19 virus thing. Why me? Well, why not you live earlier and get engulfed in the World War II? Is this true? Is this supported in Scripture elsewhere that men are caught in a cruel net? Evil befalls all men. Such times and even divert such events in the lives of his faithful ones? How far away can an individual be from a godly perspective? This continues on until the author turns to God and presents God's point of view. Fearing God and keeping his commandments will provide the duty of man, and man will indeed not have a meaningless existence, for he will have his eternal home and not go to, do, to nothing upon his physical debt. That's the last chapter. Ecclesiastes 12.5. Take a look. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, and the caper berry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while mourner, mourners go about in the street. So is there an afterlife, according to the author of Ecclesiastes? Yes!